morning again. I say again because we had some people that were joining us for Sabbath school and now of course we're moving into our worship service and we just want to praise the Lord. We have a lot to be thankful for. Amen. And uh, we're just thanking the Lord and praising God for these souls we've just seen seal their decision to follow Jesus with the covenant of baptism. And um, I think in the background I hear the angels singing. The Bible tells us there's joy in heaven when people make those decisions. I'm also thankful because um, 2020 is coming to an end. We're hoping that 2021 is going to be a different kind of year on a more positive way. I think we see light at the end of the tunnel. They say they've, uh, they've found a couple of vaccine options that uh, might help life return to some normalcy. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the day when we can all gather together again. And then without some of the uh, the encumbering uh, criteria, but uh, we, we, we're just going to hang on and endure to the end. Our message today, uh, being Thanksgiving is this coming week, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about a very biblical subject of returning thanks. I was looking in my Bible, computers make it easy, but the word thanks or thanksgiving is found 103 times in the Bible, so I would say that qualifies it as a Bible subject. You know, I was reading that uh, back in 1860, September, there was a ship that was crossing Lake Michigan at night, and just before dawn, it had a terrible collision. The name of the ship was called the Lady Elgin. It collided with a schooner. Well, it was still dark before the sun came up, called the August. The schooner suffered some uh, damage, but it pretty much poked a hole right in the side of the the Lady Elgin, which was carrying somewhere between four and 500 people. They don't know because the manifest was destroyed. The August was able to limp into shore. Chicago was only about nine miles away, but the Lady Elgin broke in two and began to rapidly sink. And as the sun was coming up, the people who had managed to grab a hold of various parts of the broken ship, they didn't have lifeboats for the folks back then, and it seemed like they weren't even able, it happened so quickly, to deploy the life vests, that they began to wash towards the shore, very rough seas, and even in September, Lake Michigan's cold. Well, the August, when it came to shore, it notified that it had struck a ship and, it, and it, they would be needing help. A number of people gathered on the shore and they could see off in the ways that people were struggling. And there were four or five young men from a nearby college, one of them, whose name was uh, Edward Spencer. He, um, I hope I'm g- giving you the right name. Yeah, Ed Spencer. Um, he was not a very strong man but he was the most experienced swimmer and so what they did is they tied a rope around him now when you try and rescue someone drowning in rough water you can both drown so they tied a rope around him and they sent him out in the cold water and one by one he would swim way out and sometimes 100 yards offshore in rough water he'd grab a hold of somebody he'd signal and they'd pull him back in and he did this 16 times and he finally fell delirious there on the shore he was so cold and shaking and exhausted and then they said there's he's heard another man shouting help 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 and he went out the man was with his wife and he got out there and he got a hold of one more struggled out got a hold of the man who held on to his wife and so he pulled in two more totaling 17 people well in the process of fighting through the debris and the waves and the cold he was injured, he was bleeding, his face was struck by a piece of floating debris, and uh, he had had such serious hypothermia and exhaustion, he never fully recovered. Uh, Years later, he went to visit his school there outside of Chicago, and they brought him up, and they said, what do you remember about that night on Lake Michigan with the sinking of the Lady Elgin? Over 300 people died. He rescued 17. He said two things. He said, one, I just wondered if I had done my best. And he said, the other thing is, none of them that I rescued ever thanked me. And, uh, you know, that struck me. His whole life has changed. He's injured. He's suffered with ill health the rest of his life, rescuing 17 people. 
Not one of the 17, he said, ever thanked him. And um, it makes us think about a story in the Bible that Jesus shares with us. If you turn in your Bibles, it's only found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 17, you've got this story of 10 lepers. And it says it happened as Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers. Now, sometimes they had leper colonies. They could have 50 or 100 people. They were all isolated. They, they had to wear masks. You know about that. Let me read this to you. It's in the Bible. Leprosy that makes us think about our day and age. Leviticus 13, verse 45. Now the leper on whom is the sore, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he'll cover his mustache. I guess that's for the men who have mustaches. It doesn't speak about the ladies' mustaches. And cry, unclean, unclean. He is unclean, and he will dwell alone. Have you had that feeling lately? In the last uh, eight months or so, you go into a store, and you've forgotten your mask, and all of a sudden you think, ah, unclean. That's happened to me many times. I jump out of my car, and as I walk up towards Walmart or my other favorite places to shop, I see everybody walking in and out with masks. I think, I'm unclean. I've got to go back to my car and get my mask. You feel separated they could not associate with other people because of the disease they were separated so they come and they're pleading with Jesus and they're asking for mercy and Jesus when he saw them he said go show yourselves to the priests now what he meant by that was when somebody had leprosy if they believed that they had either healed naturally because there are a few different kinds of skin diseases they called leprosy or if they had been miraculously healed like Miriam was, they needed to show themselves to the priest. The priests were the doctors back then, and they would uh, basically say they were declared clean or not. If they were declared clean, they could go back to life as normal. They didn't have to walk around covering their face and crying out, unclean, unclean. And uh, now when Jesus told them, go show yourself to the priest, they still had leprosy. And they might have argued and said, why would we go show ourselves to the priests to make an offering for cleansing from leprosy if we still have leprosy? But they didn't argue. That they got right. And the Bible makes an amazing statement. It says, in going, they were cleansed. Right there, friends, you've got the secret weapon of the gospel. In going, they were cleansed. As they took the first steps to do what God had commanded them to do, a miracle took place. And they were healed. So many people come to Jesus and they wonder how they're going to deal with the burden of sin. As you take the first steps, you make up your mind, by God's grace, you're going to do his will. The children of Israel walked into the Jordan. In going, the water parted. I know people say, I don't think I can quit smoking. I, I said, do you believe that God will help you do what he wants you to do? Yes. I said, well, you take the first step. Throw away your cigarettes and then we'll pray. And you might find that in going, you're cleansed. And I've seen that miracle happen so many times. You draw near to God and in going, they were cleansed. He will draw near to you. And so it's just a wonderful, powerful principle. As they began to do what Jesus commanded them to do, divine power attended their human effort and the miraculous occurred. In going, they were cleansed. Well, as they were cleansed, they began to leap up and down and they were excited and they couldn't wait to go tell their families. They couldn't wait to get the inspection, be declared clean. They had had their COVID test and they wanted the results. And it says, but one of them, when he saw he was healed, he did a U-turn. And he went back to Jesus. It doesn't say how far they had gone, but they'd gone some distance. He turned back and he went back to Jesus and with a loud voice he glorified God. Now, how is it that we glory God? How do we glorify God? What does it mean in the Bible that tells us to give glory to God, to live for his glory? One of the ways you glorify God is by thanking him. Sorry for the noise. Trying to adjust the microphone. Okay, how? a little better? There we go. He went back to glorify God, and glorifying God meant 
he thanked the Lord. You know, every time that you thank God, you're glorifying God. Especially if you're doing it in front of other people, you're giving glory to God. He turned back and he glorified God. Fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Of course, Christ was going through Samaria, so that isn't too surprising, but and Jesus thought it's interesting. I've been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. None of them came back, but the Samaritan came back. And so Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any that found, who were found to return and give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now you notice that Jesus commanded them to go, and they went. He did not command them to thank him. How many of you like thanks when you force it from someone? Do you want to command people? Now, when your kids are little and you notice someone does something for them or they give them something, you say, now what do you say? Oh, yeah, thank you, that's appropriate. You want to teach your kids, you might need to remind them to make it a habit to always say please and thank you, right? That's good parenting. But for us that are adults, if you do something for someone, you don't ever say, now what do you say? <laughs> say thank you. Do you really feel like you're blessed when you compel someone to say thank you? Jesus wanted it to be voluntary. And it should be. It should be the natural response. Now, how many were healed? Ten. How many came back? One. Came back. How many blessings do we get from God every day? How often do we forget to be grateful? And sometimes in spite of all the blessings we get, how often in spite of the blessings do we manage to complain? I'm talking to myself. I am a good complainer. Uh, I have to always remind myself of all I have to be thankful for because the carnal nature is we're predisposed to look at what we don't have instead of what we do have. We are living in an ungrateful generation. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. It says one of the attributes of the last days is people will be unthankful. You know, when you're living in such a materially rich country where you're surrounded with so many conveniences, and so many comforts, and take my words for it, friends, if you don't know and you haven't traveled, I've been to a lot of countries where people really struggle for their daily existence, and they live in hovels or they live underneath some you know, grass hut or blue plastic. And the amazing thing to me is I meet people like that that are happy. I go to those countries and I say, oh, they're so poor, and they see you and they smile and they're so happy and they're so generous. They'll invite you to their homes to feed you. And then you go away convicted. You think, boy, I'm really selfish. There's a danger when you're surrounded by so many blessings, you cease to appreciate them. Sometimes we don't know what we've got until it's gone. The opposite of gratitude is grumbling. The two cannot coexist in the same heart at the same time. The Israelites were stalled in their trip to the promised land because of what? Murmuring and complaining. Here God has just saved them from slavery. He gives them water miraculously from a rock. He rains bread down from heaven upon them. And instead of praising God whenever they encounter some trial or delay, they complain. They murmur. They grumble. Romans 1, 21, Paul talks about this when he said, for even though they knew God, they did not honor God as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. The devil is always working to try to darken our hearts and blind our eyes to all the blessings. The devil is always trying to blind our eyes to the blessings of God because realizing the blessings of God makes us live lives where we glorify God and where people who are grat we're grateful. How many of you like to be around positive people? I mean, everyone wants to be around positive people. And yet, in spite of that, sometimes we love to commiserate with our complaints. 
Again, I'm talking to myself. I heard one pastor, he was talking about those 10 lepers and only one came back to say thank you. And he said probably the other nine were thinking one of these things. Here were their excuses for ungratefulness. The nine lepers that did not come back. One doubted the cure was real. One waited to see if it would last. One said he'd come and tell Jesus later. One decided he probably never really had leprosy. One said his leprosy was already showing signs of improvement. One gave glory to the priests. Another one said any rabbi could have done it. The other one said, I'll just give a donation at the synagogue. And one figured maybe it was Jesus who caused the leprosy and that's how he could heal it. It's interesting sometimes the excuses we have for our, our lack of gratitude. So why be grateful? Why should we be grateful? True worship is thankfulness, and thankfulness is worship. Starting with the bare basics, we worship God and we're thankful we're alive. You can't, you can't worship him, you can't even complain without the power of God. It's God's goodness that gives you the life. The other reason, well, there's several reasons to be thankful, gratitude paves the way for future benefits. If um, you do something, you make some sacrifice and you help a person and they're not at all appreciative and then they have a need in the future, are you more inclined to help them or are you less inclined? Probably less inclined. But if you help somebody and they are deeply appreciative, how many of you appreciate being appreciated? You know one of the principal causes for problems in a wedding, in a marriage, well, could happen in a wedding too, a marriage is when people are dating, they express gratitude and appreciation for little things. After they get married, it's like they start feeling that it's all taken for granted. Showing and expressing appreciation never gets old. And you know what, Karen, I'm thankful one of my gifts is not laundry. I made it a point early in our marriage to wreck several loads of clothes and I was never asked again. <laughs> and Karen does the laundry and she often folds the laundry and I always thank her because I am very grateful. I don't want to do it. And uh, she makes it a point to thank me for the little things we do around the house. And I can't say I always remember. She doesn't always remember either. But we, showing appreciation even in a marriage don't take it for granted. After Jesus thanks you, how thankful were you when you were saved? After Jesus saved you, you were thankful. You should keep telling him. Don't take it for granted. Thank him for his sacrifice. He who forgets the language of gratitude can never be on speaking terms with happiness. And someone else said that there is one sense in which no gift is really ours until we have thanked the giver. No gift is really yours until you have thanked the giver. Psalm 136, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Thank him because of his everlasting loving kindness. He who forgets the language of gratitude is never on speaking terms with happiness. I think I said that. Thank God for everything. Someone said, uh, gratitude is the rarest of all virtues, yet we invariably expect it. Now, in our memory verse, it says, Psalm 103, verse 5, it says, forget not all of his benefits. What does that mean? Forget not all of his benefits. Thank the Lord. Crowns us with loving kindness. Heals all of our diseases. It says, forget not all of his benefits. That means you may not remember them all, but do not forget all of them. Because you and I, God's thoughts towards us, King David says, are more than the hairs of our head. I always feel funny quoting that. But uh, you get the point. It's numberless, his thoughts towards us and his blessings towards us. You may not remember them all, but make an effort to think of some of them. Karen was watching a devotional online last night that talked about gratitude, and they're recommending that you, you make a list. Someone challenged a friend, they said, I bet you can't think of a thousand things. And she said, I bet I can. She was able to assemble a list of a thousand things for which she was thankful. You get good at it after a little while. Bless my, the Lord, O oh my soul. Do not forget all his benefits. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 3, it says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, glory in. You know, we glorify God by thanking him. You can even glory in tribulations. That means you thank God for your troubles. Now, we're, I think, reluctant to thank God for troubles because we're thinking he's up there going, oh, you like that? I'll send you some more. <laughs> Does that make you happy? <laughs> but we should thank the Lord. Jesus said, rejoice when you're persecuted. Paul said, you know, the devil came, brought a thorn in my side, and I prayed three times, and God said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, then I will thank God for my thorn. I'm paraphrasing now. If it's going to make me more like Christ, then we even thank him for the troubles that come in our lives. Psalms, uh, sorry, Ephesians, verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. We should constantly be speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanking God all the time. You know, I'll, I'll make a little confession. I only listen to a couple of things in my car when I'm driving around. News or Christian radio. I mean, I've got, um, what do you call it? You know, I've got some USBs. I can pair it with my phone. And, but I try to listen to something spiritually edifying when I'm driving. But I sometimes listen to the news. Well, in the last few months, in case you didn't notice, the news got really intense not only with international disasters, but political division and social unrest. And I found whenever I was listening to the news, I, it was just plain old depressing. So I, I would flip on family radio and just listen to songs of praise, or they've got some preachers on there now, and I found, you know, it was less stressful. Paul said, speaking to yourself, it's okay to talk to yourself. In Psalms, do you sing to yourself when you go around the house? Sometimes I go through the Amazing Facts office and I'm singing when I get there and I thought, oh, I might be singing off key. And then I get in the door and I think, what, this is a Christian ministry. You can sing off key here. Just every, make a joyful noise to the Lord, right? God made canaries. He also made crows. And one sounds better than the other, but sing to the Lord. Whatever's going on. Someone once said, the difference between a prison and a monastery, one is a place of thanksgiving and one is a place of cursing. You know that little poem, two men looked out of prison bars, one saw mud and one saw stars? It depends on whether you're looking up or looking down. And on any given day, here in Northern California, flying over the countryside, you can find two birds very different from each other. One is a vulture. We see them right off the back of our church property here because there's thermals. And uh, sometimes they're flying right level with the, the office there and, and they look beautiful in the air, but you don't want to watch how they eat. You think they look graceful in the air, but they're actually looking for something dead. And in the same countryside, you've got hummingbirds. Two birds. One is looking for some flowers, something sweet. They're looking for nectar. And the other one is looking for something dead that stinks. <laughs> and they're going to go feed on that. You've got hummingbirds and vultures in the church. You know what I mean? You've got some people, you talk to them, they're always talking about the latest scandal. They're looking for something rotten to talk about. <laughs> or they're complaining. And you're reluctant to say, how are you doing? Because you always get some kind of litany of all their troubles. And then you got the hummingbirds. And you, don't you like watching hummingbirds? Yeah, they're iridescent colors and, and uh, they're always looking for something sweet. And it's that way in life too. You know, no matter what's happening, you can always be thankful. And I was uh, listening to a Christian program last night and they were saying that this has been a tough year. And that Thanksgiving in 2020 almost sounds like an oxymoron. You know what an oxymoron is. Two words that contradict each other, like jumbo shrimp, pretty ugly, military intelligence, woman driver, which I think that just usually don't go to. The men were laughing. 
So when you say 2020, Thanksgiving, you think pandemic, natural disasters, polarized politics, social unrest and riots, economic gyrations, and you go, now let's get together and, and can't even get together with your family and have Thanksgiving. And some are thankful for that. <laughs> for them, Thanksgiving is a time of trouble. <laughs> Depends on your family. But in all things, we can give thanks. Listen to this verse from Habakkuk. And uh, he's talking about a time when they had come back from the captivity, the cities had been burned, and listen to what he says. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, this is great. And verse 18. Though the fig tree may not blossom, though there be no fruit on the vine, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, yield no food, though the flock might be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. So if you put that in 2020, even though you've got all this isolation and restriction and pandemic and uh, the economic challenges and the shutdowns and the politics and the, the natural disasters, and, and I'm sure I'm leaving things out, I will join in the Lord. I'll rejoice in the God of my salvation. So how are you thankful? Well, you express it verbally. You sing, you make joy, you try to uplift others. Thanksgiving also means, you know, thanks means giving. When you're thankful, it also means you give. Psalm 107, verse 22, let them sacrifice with the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And when you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your own free will. God wants us to do it from our hearts. You know, I'm... I'm amazed by the story of Naaman. You know, Naaman the leper, 2 Kings chapter 5, talks about this. He's a Syrian general dying from leprosy. Elisha the prophet tells him, go wash in the Jordan seven times. At first he doesn't want to do it. But his servants say, they, you know, at first they can't talk to him because he's got leprosy. But as he's riding home to die, it says they draw near to him. Even though he's contagious. And they say, Master, if he had asked you to do something hard, you wouldn't have done it. How much easier if he says, wash and be clean. So he humbles himself and he goes down to the Jordan River. He's halfway between Samaria and Damascus. He washes seven times. He dunks himself seven times. Kind of a seven-time baptism. Comes up, his leprosy is gone, a symbol of how sin is washed away by the grace of God. And he is so thankful. Now, you know what he does? Instead of going home to his family and his friends and tell his people he's now clean, he turns back and this Gentile goes back to Elisha and says, I am so thankful. Take a blessing. And he offers him basically $20 million in silver, gold, and clothing by today's standards. He could have taken his money and gone home. There was no medical bill. And Elisha, by the way, wouldn't take anything. He says, this is a symbol of salvation. It's free. You can't buy it. But the natural response of his grateful heart for his healing from this disease was to give, to at least tell Elisha thank, his, uh, his thanks. I'm always amazed. Listen to all the trouble that David went through when he was running from Saul all those years, and yet he thanked the Lord. David had some challenges in his life, but he wrote so many beautiful songs of thanks Psalm 30, verse 12, Oh, my Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Daniel's about to go to the lion's den. And it says, When he knew the writing was signed, Daniel 6, verse 10, he went home in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day. He prayed and gave thanks before his God. Would thanks have been part of your prayer if you were about to be cat food? As his custom was from the early days. Even Jonah, who was a grumbling prophet, when he's finally down at the bottom of the mountains in a digestive system of that sea monster, read Jonah chapter 2, he prays and he thanks God. Do you, know, do you know when Jonah's captivity ended? 
when he finally thanked God, it says, then the Lord spoke to the fish. Now that's a very important lesson. His liberation, his salvation, his freedom, it all happened. It pivoted on his thanking God in spite of the fact not too many of you would thank God if you were in a dark place surrounded by sushi. Yeah. It was not a pleasant experience, I'm sure, but he thanked the Lord and God spoke to the fish and everything began to change. You can read many of the Psalms, like Psalm 92, 1 and 2. It's called a song for the Sabbath day. And what is that song for the Sabbath? What day is today? It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to his name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Paul and Silas are in prison. They've been whipped, falsely accused. And the Bible says at midnight, the darkest hour, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. You know when Christians are the best witnesses? When we are positive in dark times. Have you ever met a Christian that uh, even though you know they're going through trials, you know their life is tough, they stay positive? Anybody can witness in the light. Some people complain in the sunshine. But Christians know how to glorify God even in the dark. I'll tell you a little amazing fact. Speed of sound in the air is about 700 miles an hour. Depends on air pressure. The speed of sound down in the dark water is four times the speed of sound in the air. Do you know a humpback whale's call can be heard 400 miles, no, 4,000 miles away. 4,000 miles away because sound travels better in the water in the dark than it does in the light, in the air. You know when God's people are the greatest witnesses? In trial. It was on the cross that Jesus mounted his best witness, isn't it? Children of Israel, that great story of the Exodus, it was during the time of plagues and turmoil. The greatest witness. Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, Jonah in the belly of the whale. That's when God's people, Mordecai and I, Esther, it's God's people shine the brightest when they're faithful and positive in times of trial. So 2020 is a great opportunity for us to let our light shine. Can you say amen? And Jesus was thankful. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. At the Last Supper, knowing he's about to go to the cross, he took the cup and he gave thanks. Psalm 103, verse 10, we can thank the Lord if for nothing else it says, thank him that he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Everybody ought to say thank you for that or God might revoke his mercy. <laughs> You know, I, I saw this, uh, someone said, thank the Lord for all the good that hasn't happened, the, all the bad things that haven't happened, all the good that you have. Someone wrote a letter home to their parents from college. A young lady wrote this letter. Dear mom and dad, sorry I haven't written sooner. It's been a difficult year writing with my left hand. I broke my right arm and leg when I jumped from the second floor of my dormitory during the fire. But I was lucky, a young man from the tattoo parlor saw the blaze and he called the fire department. My books and clothes were burnt, but they saved the room. I assure you, the fire had nothing to do with the marijuana they found. Spike, from the tattoo parlor, he came to see me every day when I was in the hospital. And because it was taking so long to get the dorm room livable again, he was nice enough to let me move in with him. This is better since the baby's due in seven months. Don't worry, Spike and I plan to get married just as soon as he can get his divorce finalized and find another job. I hope things are okay at home. I'm doing fine. I'll write more when my hand tremors go away. Love your daughter, Susie. P.S. None of the above is true, but I did get a C in sociology and a D in chemistry, and I wanted you to receive this news in its proper perspective. <laughs> Happiness comes when we stop wailing about the troubles we have and we offer thanks to God for the troubles we don't have. And I remember hearing an interesting story. I like uh, studying aviation. And there was a pilot, Fred Hargensheimer, a tall gentleman. In 1943, he was shot down flying over New Britain, New Guinea by the Japanese. 
And there in the jungle, he struggled to survive. He parachuted out. He was separated from his aircraft. And uh, Karen and I have been twice to New Guinea. And I'll tell you, you get there, out there in the jungles, there mountains are very steep, very rugged terrain. It rains a lot, a lot of tropical disease. And, and it could be a, a jungle that could consume a person pretty quickly. And after 31 days, he was in pretty dire shape. He was just eating bugs and whatever he could find and injured partially from his, his uh, landing. Well, some members of the Nakani tribe found him. But instead of turning him over to the Japanese, they risked their lives. If the Japanese had found out that they were harboring an American pilot, they would have executed the whole tribe. They risked their lives and they protected Fred for five months and they fed him, nursed him back to health. They finally, through a series of secret encounters, connected him with the Australian Coast Guard, who then transferred him to the Navy. Eventually he made it back home, fully recovered. And he was so thankful for what they had done for him, he could never forget it. So he looked at the desperate conditions they were living in back then, and he raised thousands of dollars, and he flew over with his son, and he built a school. And then over the years, he made about 40 trips to New Guinea and continued to build up the community, build the infrastructure, because he said, I wanted to give back. I wanted to show appreciation because of what they had done for me, and they, they'd saved me. When he retired from 1970 to 1974, he and his wife Dorothy moved to New Guinea and they lived with them for four years, helping teach and build in the community, built a library and built up the whole village. Then, when he was 90 years old, they found his P-38 that had crashed in the jungle and he made his last trip back. They always called him Master Pretty. They couldn't say Freddy. They called him Masa Pretty. And um, they, they treated him like, you know, a hero. But he was just going back. He said, you know, I think a person should um, return their gratitude. I would not have survived without their help. And he never forgot it. Now, we may not remember everything God has done for us, but we shouldn't forget everything either. I, one of the best ways to demonstrate our Christianity is to live lives that bring glory to God. I want to be a thankful person, don't you? And live lives that will glorify his name. And I thank the Lord. Oh, I praise God. That, you know what a miracle it is that we have this building that I trust that we're going to be able to dedicate without debt? One of these days, we're going to set a date. We're not setting a date yet because you all know that would be reckless right now. But when it looks like the coast is clear, we're going to set a date. We're going to have a dedication to this building. We'll invite all of you who are watching and be able to fill the place. I praise God. That's a miracle of God. I praise God for our meetings that just completed, these baptisms that we witnessed today. And I praise God that in spite of, uh, you know, all that's going on in the world, we still have toilet paper in our house, <laughs> even though they're clearing the shelves everywhere else. I mean, there's, thank him for the big things and the little things, right? I want to be a, a grateful people. And we'd encourage you to just uh, count your blessings this season. If you're able in some way to get together with some of your family safely, we, uh, we hope that you'll remember to be thankful. Even though 2020 has been a tough year, uh, even though there are, there's no cattle in the stall and there's no grain in the fields, we can glory in the God of our salvation. Amen. I'd like to pray with you. And then after my prayer, we'll be inviting our our band that was nice enough to play for us, they're going to come up and they're going to provide our, our music for us, I believe, at the conclusion. So would you bow your heads with me, please? And those who are watching. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We thank and praise you for all of your goodness. First and foremost, we thank you for providing cleansing from the leprosy of sin. And Lord, I pray we'll never grow weary of the appreciation that we have in sending your Son your beloved son into the world to suffer on the cross for all the sins that we've ever committed. I pray we'll never take that for granted and that love for you will be the spring of action in all that we do. Lord, forgive us for the times when we do whine and grumble and complain. We fixate and focus on the things we don't have or something that went wrong. Help us remember that whatever happens to us, you can work all these things together for our good 
so that we can be thankful even through the trials that come. And Lord, I pray that in these days of darkness that your people will be like a light on the hill that will shine and witness for others by our positive attitude, looking for the good things in life. Bless us this day, Lord. Be with all those wherever they're gathered and they're watching. Help us to sense your presence. Give us the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you can uh, prepare us to prepare others for your soon return. We thank you and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, those who are baptized today, we look forward to seeing you in the uh, foyer.